Let's just read God's word together, because that's what we're here for today. Mark 11. <clears throat> if you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1067, the year after William the Conqueror. 1067, come on, work it out. 1066, yes. 1067, page Mark 11, the first 11 verses. This is the word of God. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, tell him the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street, tied at a doorway, and as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So, I have to... Woo -hoo. Um, on this Palm Sunday morning, indeed. And I'm going to be drawing your attention to that passage that I read in Mark 11. And uh, yeah, I love donkey stories. You know, um, it reminds me of the little girl who went down her garden and she said, came back and she said to her grandma, she said, Grandma, there's a Christian donkey down at the gate. And her mum says, uh, right, yeah. And she oh, I know there's probably going to be a donkey there. There's one next door. Uh, a Christian donkey? Oh, yeah, she said. It's got such a long face. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, there you see. The message gets through, doesn't it? Oh, my, my donkey, look, he's more friendly, isn't he? Our subject this morning is about the king. And it's about Jesus coming. And, uh, you know, sometimes enormous and great tragedies happen. Um, I well remember quarter to seven one Friday night just going off to prayer meeting. It was the 22nd of November, 1963. And the news came through that Mr Kennedy, John Fitzgerald, had been assassinated. And stood beside this man's uh, grave, that everlasting flame, and think of a young man cut down in his prime. A uh, man who, well, it was all so unexpected. The whole nation, indeed the world, was stunned. This sort of thing doesn't happen, didn't happen. Well, I know it, it did happen. I mean, it sparked off the First World War and all sorts of things, but with news media and everything, it was all so different. And uh, it... it Begs this question, I mean, you've got Jesus at 33, um, and I shall ask this question tonight. But if you knew where you were going to die, would you ever go there? All right. Say, all right, I knew I was going to die in Roffey. It's a sure thing, I'm not going to go to Roffey. No way am I going to Roffey. As if I go to Roffey, ah, it might be now. Oh no, I'm not ready now. I'll go another way. I'm not going to Roffey. If you knew that this is exactly the situation with Jesus, you see. He knew where he was going to die. They warned him not to go to the Passover and to go to Jerusalem at this particular time because while well, feeling was beginning to rise a bit and, and there were antagonists and the religious leaders 
they will want to see him out of the way and gone. Read the beginning of Matthew 26. And the scribes and Pharisees, they got together. These people who don't normally get together, they did. And uh, they determined that he was going to die. And the one thing also they determined was it would not be on the feast day. When did Jesus die? On the feast day. You see, God's in control. God's in control. You may think man is in control. Man's heart divides it away, we read in the Proverbs. But the Lord directs his steps. And look at the way Jesus comes in. I, I love this, this account. Because we're introduced to a Syrian cult. Let me explain. I remember, well, in fact, I, I knew of a jockey who was saved through on one Palm Sunday by this particular aspect of the story. He said, there's no way anybody is going to get on the back of that Syrian cult. It's unbroken. It's never been ridden. It will be as wild as any wild horse you could ever imagine. It will buck and jump. And they brought this colt to Jesus. And they threw their coat, cloaks over it. And it just stood there. I mean, that should have caused it to kick and really jump around. And Jesus just sat on it. It was a miracle. Jesus tamed the wild, especially we're told. Never anyone had ever sat on this, this animal. We're told for this particular reason. He tamed the wild. The creator, the maker <coughs> of all creatures, great and small. And the maker, the creator, sat upon the one when one day the lion and the lamb are going to lay down together in all the perfection and bliss of heaven. And there was the king of heaven sitting on this Syrian cult of all animals, probably one of the most wild of animals. And yet he comes on a donkey cult, symbol of peace. No great white war horse, he should, the king should have been coming in a great big white Arabian steed. That would have been wonderful, wouldn't it? You see, Jesus knew. Don't ever overlook the foreknowledge of Jesus. He knew all that was going to happen. I know it's lovely when he said, go up there, you're going to find a, a colt tied up there. <laughs> really? Yeah. It, it's, it's just there. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and... Untie it. And oh, and if the people, he knew they were going to say, but if they ask you, just say the master needs to borrow it for a bit. He'll bring it back later. Which they did, and they let it go. I mean, this animal was quite valuable, excuse me. Right, okay. The master. No names, the master. There's only one. One is my master, even Christ. Love it. The foreknowledge of Jesus, the authority of Jesus. He has need of it. Friends, he may have need of you this morning in his service or just for a one-off job or something maybe you've been asked to do in the church. I've no idea why is the Holy Spirit laying this on my heart now. God speaking to you about a one-off for Jesus. You are his before ever you or anyone else's. His authority. I lay my all before him now. You've just been singing it. And there was obedience. They let him go. They let the cult go. I love the obedience. But it's through the Spirit of God working. He'd been there ahead of them. Indeed, this was the king, you see. This is the Messiah, God's son. You read those words in Zechariah 9.9. There's a fulfilment of those lovely words. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. 
He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And such is the detail of the Holy Spirit through the prophecy of Zechariah. It's not just any donkey. It's a donkey's colt he's going to go be riding on. Get the detail right. God is a God of detail. He, God is a God who gets everything right. He's not a casual, laid back, oh, I'll listen to. He plans it. Every detail of your life. When, when you start reading such wonderful verses as in Romans 8 and verse 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. All things is all things. As you had in, you have further on down in verse 37, in all these things we're more than conquerors, in all of them, through him who loved us. Amazing. God of detail. I love it. Wonderful. I'm just going to share three things. Oh, yeah, you see, you thought that was a sermon. <laughs> Sorry, just, I know lunch is coming up. Three, three subjects, <coughs> just very briefly, we're going to look at this morning. If you take notes, you can have a note. You can, uh, you can note them down. The people, the pathway, and the popularity. The people, first of all. Indeed. Well, we got through all of those. Look at that. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, are these people genuine? This is the first question I'm going to ask. All these, you know, hosannas, you know, wonderful. Oh, here's Jesus. Oh, isn't he tremendous? The great preacher coming down from Nazareth. Oh, look at him. Isn't he terrific? Let's go. Are they genuine? Do they really mean it? Indeed, there's a great deal of show. There's a load of excitement. What a scene. Behold, your king is coming to you. In fact, Jesus said the very stones would have cried out. Amazing. So, well, what king did they see? That's the question. Indeed, I'm going to ask really another question to try and answer it. With what eyes did they see this king? You see, they were natural eyes, not spiritual eyes. They weren't eyes of faith. These were people who saw this one coming as maybe the liberator. The one who can set them free from the bondage of Rome and uh, these who have oppressed them. They saw the king, the deliverer, rather than the one, the deliverer from their natural enemies, rather than from sin and from Satan. Material rather than the spiritual blessing that they were looking for. And, well, okay, then, what king did they see? Well, yes, it was an earthly king, wasn't it? More than a heavenly king. That's who they saw. And all the city was moved. I'm, I'm bound to pause here just for a minute. But, but friend, what do you see in Jesus? What is he to you? I was speaking with, I speak to people all the time about Jesus, and I meet all sorts of people, I might add. And uh, the number of people who, who you meet, you get into conversation, and, and they say, yeah, wow, he was a good man. Mm, yeah, he was that. What we call in suffer, a good old boy. But genuinely so, you know? That's said with affection, by the way. And uh, he was a good man. He was that, sure. Yeah, and he was, uh, well, yeah. Um, yeah, he lived a good life. Yeah, did good work. <coughs> right? 
Gives you Easter eggs though, doesn't he? Ah. Yeah, dreadful death, wasn't it? Yeah. And all you hear is, he was, he was, he was, he used to be, he was there. He's, he's the Jesus of history. Came into this world, gone, finished, done, forgotten. Written off. Oh, right. I don't know. What do you, what do you see in Jesus this morning? <coughs> Yesterday's man? Indeed. Some see him as a good man. I knock one of the O's out and say he was God's man. Because, you see, you say he was yesterday's man, I say he's today's man. Because my Bible tells me that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. What is the third word? Two little letters. Jesus Christ is, not was, is. Not used to be, is. Not could be, future, is. The same. Jesus is alive today. Every other religion in the world, their leader is dead. Jesus is alive. He's here. You ask me how I know? He's here. He's with you. He's within you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is the same. And so with what eyes do you see Jesus this morning? I see Jesus as the, the Jesus of now. The Jesus of this morning. Uh, indeed, the, the, the Jesus of my future, certainly. Forever with him. Forever. And he is the Jesus who was. In fact, it's lovely when you're reading through Revelation, which I was doing just recently. <coughs> who was and is and is to come. Lovely. That's my Jesus. The people. Well... Were they genuine? Well, hang on, we're going to have to move on a bit because um, <coughs> we'll see the answer presently, perhaps. But I'm more concerned about you. Are you genuine? Or are you one of these people, you know, isn't he lovely, isn't he kind, isn't he lovely, gentle Jesus, and the Jesus of yesterday? What about the pathway then? Where does it lead? Well, this was the road that led on for several more days' journey. This is Sunday morning. He's come in, he's had a, a, um, the, the, the quiet Sabbath, the last Sabbath that he was to spend on earth as uh, uh, a worshipper. And uh, he'd went, gone up through the uh, Jericho Valley and up through to Bethany to stay with his friends. Um, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. He, that, that, was his, that was his little home, really, second home. They were so kind to him. And he loved being with them. And, um, yep, they had their, their Sabbath. And then on the Sunday, he goes in, this is where we are, into Jerusalem. He went back on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And this is the road, and it's going to lead on for several more days through miracles, through teaching, through testing, through solitude, through an arrest on Thursday night, well, <coughs> early hours, Friday morning probably, nearly one o'clock in the morning maybe, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then a trial going on through probably the Sanhedrin met around about six in the morning. And uh, in the meantime, he'd been teased, buffeted, questioned by Caiaphas and others. And uh, then for, uh, well, the trial, a couple of hours or more, false trial. The Jews couldn't find a fault. They couldn't find, they couldn't find a reason for the death sentence. So they shoved him over to the Romans and said, please, you, you, uh, you deal with it. Put him to death. And why? Oh, well, he says Caesar's his friend, you know. 
he's the king, but Caesar's the real king, isn't he? As if the Jews would say that. Of course they didn't say that, but they did to trap Jesus. They'd do anything to trap him. Indeed, the trial, the ignominy, the cruel death. Silence of Saturday. The glory of Sunday. Wonderful. Easter morning. The road to Calvary. That's what we're on, really. It's the road to Calvary. And uh, this is the road many people start out on this road. Many. And there's hundreds and thousands of these people who are all you know, crying the name of Jesus and the whole city has moved and it's a tremendous day. It was a glorious day for Jesus and the followers. He's so popular. Everybody wanted to see him and be with him. And yet, many start out, but few last out. That's the sadness, isn't it? You see, this path may have had an exciting beginning. All the joy and the praise. You know where it leads and through what it leads. And it may be something of a story of your, of your Christian life a little bit. Maybe you began well. Maybe a tremendous test where you were going to save the world. And then everything seemed to just cool off. And where you were going, you know, worship every time your church doors were open. Now, once a week, if you feel like it. But if you don't, don't worry. Go next week. What's the price to preach on? I don't know. Ah, oh, here online. You say, do you? Good intentions. And it begins to wane off. And then someone takes the mick at work. Then your neighbour gets at you. And then the devil starts whispering in your ear, what's the point of being a Christian? Anyway, if you're a Christian and you're saved, heaven's secure and assured, isn't it? Oh, well, don't worry about the rest. Just take it easy. You don't have to go to church to, be, to go to heaven, do you? You don't have to. You don't have to read your Bible every day. You don't have to pray for all those people all the time. And so, what started out as good hasn't lasted out. It's waned off. And uh, taking up your cross it's not what you do anymore much. Certainly not every day. Friend, I encourage you just to look to Jesus during the days of this week, please. Be thinking of him because he loved you. Think of that children's talk. He loved you and he carried your sins to the cross for you. All right? I must come to the last. Because <coughs> the people, are they real? The popularity, will it last? <coughs> That's the question we come to now. Because the pathway, where does it lead? It leads to Calvary. But it leads on to resurrection morning. But this popularity, oh, there was a great multitude, verse 8 told us. And they were also gathered this great multitude on Friday morning, I understand. Ah ha ha. And so we've got some of Sunday morning's crowd there on Friday morning, have we? We quite certainly may well have. And Friday morning, we're up by the fort indeed, and uh, the Roman governor brings out the prisoners because it's the custom. He thought this is the answer. It's the custom at the Passover to release a prisoner. And so he gets the worst one he's got, Barabbas. I mean, he's murderer. I mean, come on. <laughs> a terrorist of the first order. You're not going to have him back on the streets, are you? No, of course you're not. 
And then he has Jesus. So you make your choice. And he couldn't believe it. They cried out for Barabbas to be set free. And what shall I do with Jesus? Crucify was the great cry from the crowd. Crucify. And the religious leaders were whipping up the crowds. You know, like, like you're, sorry, you haven't got a football ground here, have you? No, okay. Portland Road up in uh, uh, Ipswich. But you can hear the crowds roar. Amazing crowd. And so the, the cry goes up, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. This is the cry. Excuse me, these people... Some of them, they were probably crying Hosanna and, and really thrilled to see Jesus on Sunday morning. Indeed, the Palm Sunday of High became a Good Friday die. How sad it is that many go to Jerusalem, but few go on to Calvary. Indeed, many may be moved by the cross and the preaching of the cross and of Jesus. But alas, I've seen seed fall by the wayside or on stony or thorny ground and uh, there was no lasting fruit. Indeed, so far but no further. Christian, I trust that is not your story this morning. If it is, Jesus welcomes you to come on. Indeed, he, his arms are open. Don't just be a person that goes when he is popular, but not when he's not. Love going to a big church, big congregation. But don't go to a little church, do you? I mean, the singing's not all that good, is it? I mean, they've got a very good Sunday school, have they? Heard it all before. Tell the story. I went to be. I was called to be a pastor. Well, in several places, I was being called back in '75, um, and and it was obvious that God was calling me away. It was a church in South Africa, Pretoria, a church in Richmond, Virginia, large church up in Suffolk. Church in Ascot. Big churches. One Thursday I got a letter. Oh, it's only, I think it might have been two sentences. It may have only been one. You can see it now. Half of A4. Dear David, we met on Sunday afternoon. And we're all fully persuaded God is calling you to be our pastor. I read the words. <coughs> and God spoke. You've circled this mountain long enough. Get you northward. Phoned up that night and said we're on our way. God wants us to come. Oh, there's no promise of a house or wages or anything. Nothing. Nothing at all. In fact, the church hardly existed. On the roll, there was nine members. Five were active. The other four weren't well enough. They were too elderly and frail. And of those five, three I'd seen converted and baptised. And I went to be their pastor for 34 and a third years. What a privilege. Loveliest church in the world. I know what small churches are all about. Five sat on the front seat, first Sunday morning, communion. That was it. Vast great chapel gallery, the lot. Empty seats. And a village. And only a dozen went to the church. God sent a godly vicar a month before me 
And we used to meet every Friday. And we prayed together every Friday morning for 10 years. And from the very first week, God started filling the pews. The first prayer, all the Christians who live in the village would worship in the village. God answered that. Came to Easter, then we started seeing the first converts. Easter Monday morning, 8 o'clock, my bell was ringing. Chap, <coughs> chap had cycled seven miles. He'd been to Reading Pop Festival. Yeah, he hit drugs too. Hair right down to his waist. And he rang my door about 8 o'clock, Easter Monday morning. He said, I've got to get right with God, he said. You're right, he said, those stones are going to cry out if I don't. He was the first convert. You see, Jesus matters. And you don't just go when there's a church is big and thriving and exciting. You go because you, you go to serve Jesus. Not to serve your pastor and deacons, of course, we bless God for them all. But I'm here because Jesus sent me here. As much as I love you all, I look forward to your dinner, Nigel. But I'm here because I am God's servant. I serve him. What a privilege, isn't it? Hey, listen, you've been very patient. But there's many who go to Jerusalem and few go to Calvary. So the question, where are you now in relation to Jesus? Close or far away? Is your religious pomp and show a mockery? Does your spiritual pathway only go so far with Jesus? A number of people I know who become Christians and they say, well, I say, yeah, and have you, have you uh, publicly professed this? Have you been baptised? Well, no, but you don't have to be baptised, do you, to go to heaven? I say, well, it depends if you want to please Jesus or not. He's asked you to. He said, follow me. And if he's going to go through water and be baptised and he'll say, do this in remembrance of me and take the Lord's Supper, uh, I said, well, let's, oh, well, I can take communion in some churches. They let that. I, they probably do, but I said, I'm not talking about you. The friend, don't dodge around things. Let, let indeed our spiritual pathway not go so far for Jesus, let it go as far as we can for Jesus. Put him number one, king of kings. And we lay our all before his feet this morning. Let's start afresh this Easter and let us realise that don't back off because Jesus, your king, never gave up. And he comes to you now with a fresh invitation that you know very well indeed. I've come to a conclusion. These lovely words. This is Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Indeed, um, I've got another half a sermon to preach. I'm not even going to turn the page. My friends, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and he is just to forgive. You know, I, I at the end, when I was preparing the sermon, darling, that lovely word, shout to the Lord, all the earth. Let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Because on this, uh, on this Palm Sunday morning, well, Jesus is king. He's wonderful. It's tremendous. I wish I could serve him better. I really do. Because he deserves the best. Right? He jolly well does. And if he wants this tenor I've got in my pocket, he'd have it, please. He went to Calvary for me. It's not about money, it's not about material things. It's about heaven. It's about my children.
It's about my lovely wife. It's, it's about my family, that they all may be together, one in Christ Jesus. Pray for them every morning of my life. All of you. 